Hello and welcome back to the FEM channel. Our next speaker is Kai Kunze. He is a professor at the Graduate School of Media Design at Kaio University, Japan. His talk will be about uh, frisson waves. From what I've understood is that it's about shivers and goosebumps in, in media performances that are usually spontaneous, but somehow he and his team managed to induce them artificially. Um, but I'm really forward, I'm looking very forward to this talk as I don't really understand it right now. Um, if you want to ask questions uh, in the HackInt RC at the channel RC3-FEM, in the rocket chat at the channel uh, FEM, and in, on Twitter and the Fediverse and the hashtag RC3FEM without the dash. You can ask questions that will be answered in the Q&A session afterwards. Für alle deutschsprachigen Zuschauer, uh, ihr könnt die, die Übersetzung zuhören, indem ihr die Sprache im Webplayer von Native auf Translated ändert. And now, I'm looking forward to a hopefully very interesting talk. Um, hello and welcome to my talk, uh, Frisson Waves, Augmenting Aesthetic Chills in Classical Music Performances. Um, this is um, conceptual early uh, research work from a collaboration of a lot of artists, uh, designers, uh, researchers, and I'm just a speaker uh, to introduce it to you a little bit. Uh, my name is Kai. And in the next 20 minutes, I will talk to you a little bit about what is Frisson, give you a bit of motivation and background information, why we are interested uh, in this feeling. And then I will talk about uh, how can we uh, recognize, induce, and also share Frisson. And then at the end, I'll talk about uh, some conclusion and a little bit of outlook. So the question is, what is frisson? Um, you might not have heard the term. I actually haven't heard uh, frisson before we started the research uh, two and a half years, three years ago, but I definitely knew the feeling. So if you're listening attentively to a musical piece, uh, sometimes you might get goosebumps or some shiver down uh, your spine. And um, that is usually triggered from the music. A uh, frisson is uh, from the French uh, shivers. And sorry, my pronunciation with the German accent. Uh, so um, you uh, uh, part for that, I hope. And it's this psychophysiological phenomenon um, that we feel when we get these goosebumps or shivers that are triggered from music, but also other experiences. And you might wonder why goosebumps? How can goosebumps be related to a positive uh, feeling? And there is actually no need answer. A lot of theories. Um, one that I particularly like um, is that frisson is often induced over music or over some kind of stimulus that is repetitive, that has a certain pattern, and that at one point the pattern breaks and that surprises you. So this triggers your autonomous nervous system, so the fight or flight response. You get the surprise, you wonder, alertness goes up, and you realize that there's no danger and you will relax and feel these aesthetic chills. So the talk I will give today is an exploration of the feeling of frisson with technology. So how could we detect, induce or transmit it using especially variable sensors and actuators? And to be a little bit uh, acclimatic, I can already tell you that this is still in process. So this is really exploratory work. However, you might also wonder, why do you care about this? Why do you want to do this? And, you know, one reason, of course, is because we can and because it's fun. And I think that's definitely, you know, kind of one aspect of, of the research. However, also another reason is, so our lab in Yokohama 
works in human factors research, so uh, HCI, human computer interaction. And we lately revisited a lot of work also from cybernetics, also nonlinear dynamics uh, in terms of research and also uh, in terms of art and performance, uh, we are very much inspired by uh, Stellark's work on extending and augmenting our body. And there's this um, realization, if you work on research, that you know knowledge is not merely functional. There's always some kind of enjoyment in understanding a concept. And I think also this community will really understand uh, that type of uh, feeling. And this uh, sense of wonder and this feeling we also want to explore. We want to understand ourselves better in terms of uh, cognition, perception, but also in terms of our feeling. And actually last year I uh, gave also a talk on, on Boiling Mind, on an effective feedback loop that we played with and uh, started researching on. And to some extent this uh, frisson, fr frisson Wave uh, talk is just a continuation of this. And overall, we're just also looking for more creative ways to use physiological data or other variable computing sensing that is not related to surveillance. So extended to this, um, we also wonder, what does it mean to be live? It's easy right, if you think about transmitting audio or video, easy in quotation marks, because, um, yeah, there are some experts that know a lot about that. And I see also the effort that goes into uh, the uh, remote experience and other congresses or conferences. Uh, however, we still don't know how to transmit an atmosphere or a feeling that's much more difficult. I think the Congress is a very nice example for that because it moved from Berlin to Hamburg to Leipzig. But every time I visited, I kind of felt at home. I felt, oh yeah, these are, you know, kind of the people I like. These are the uh, culture, the community I belong to, even though it's at different places. And we wonder, you know, how kind of how can we transmit that, these types of feeling and two uh, efforts that we get inspired from uh, from this work is one is NeuroLife, that's a project, uh, an EU project with co-investigator Jamie Ward and also a cybernetic being uh, project uh, here in Japan uh, headed by Kota Minamisawa that deals with uh, things like parallel agency and similar. And both of them are actually also collaborators in the work that I will present today. So this is the high level overview why we are interested in frisson, but now getting back to the aesthetic chills. And first, the question is, how could we go about and try to detect or recognize them? Looking into related work, of course, we see frisson or aesthetic chills, of course, affect our physiology. And the first thing that you notice is, of course, the pylori erection, so the goosebumps that you can get on your arm. So the hairs go up. So we could try to detect that. However, that might be a little bit difficult because some people might not have so much hair on, uh, on them and so on. So then looking into other um, physiological changes, respir uh, respiratory rate is going up. Uh, for the sweat glands, electrodermal activity, you will see more peaks. That's a stress and excitement indicator. And heart rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, and usually heart rate variability related features go down. Oh, because also, if you saw uh, last year's talk, we already built a system to record uh, electrodermal activity, so the sweating on the hand, as well as uh, heart rate, we just thought we'll move along and use that. Luckily, we also um, did a uh, redesign of the wristbands in the meantime, so they look a little bit nicer now. And you see also a live demo on my uh, background right now. So you see uh, EDA and heart rate behind. And if I press here, you should also see some noise on the sensor. The visualization, by the way, is done by uh, Kirill Kirill Rakotsin. 
So thanks for uh, the uh, work. And uh, then, you know, moving forward, so we use these wristbands uh, to set up a control experiment to detect aesthetic chill events. We just added a trigger, so to add some self-reporting uh, to it. So in this case, we really use the user as a self-report to classify or to label the frisson events. That has, of course, you know, also some limitations. So we hope that that's uh, good enough to capture it. And uh, we used uh, some music pieces also from related work and uh, did some counterbalancing and run this lab study uh, just in uh, yeah, kind of controlled space, so with headphones and so on. Uh, we um, finished this, but then we also wondered, you know, how does it look like in um, real life, in the wild experiments? So we also uh, organized a concert with uh, 18 audience members uh, for one hour musical program and the setup was the same so everybody got a wristband and a trigger we also added a foot center for the pi pianist so using eda from the foot actually work works also relatively well and uh, then recorded here the data and hope that uh, people would report their frisson their aesthetic chills Here's now uh, one video, a short minute video uh, that uh, shows you uh, the recording. about the analysis uh, I have to say I'm sorry the this is still ongoing so we don't really have a, a lot of results yet and of course there were a lot of issues with the live recording um, if you're interested in doing something similar uh, contact some of the technical staff or also me uh, we can give you hints I'm doing this now over 15 or 20 years and always something is going wrong uh, depending on uh, the, the setting and so on. Now I also know more about uh, uh, classical music concerts. However, we got some useful data. Uh, the problem there was we could also train a machine learning model because we really wanted to detect it real time and it seemed to work really well. We're just still not sure if it really works or not so we want to be very careful about that so we get higher accuracies back but given the limited amount of users we had or so on we want to look into that a little bit more however the analysis as well as the data sets will be publicly available and if you want to get them a little bit earlier just also contact me so then moving on this is the progress on detection how does it look like for triggering or inducing frisson so there's also a lot of cool related work. I just show or highlight two of them. Uh, one is work by Shoko Fukushima uh, et al. And they're using the electrostatic effect on the arm to control piloerection. And they use it to uh, increase the surprise feeling of uh, somebody. So you put your arm inside and they can control the py uh, piloerection. Uh, other work is from Ha et al., uh, where they're using three Peltier elements on your back, on your spine, and they activate them upwards to also in in induce uh, frisson or aesthetic chills. Uh, the problem with those two setups, it's quite hard to get them into a, conf uh, into a uh, concert hall. And, uh, you know, some people might not really have much hair on uh, their arms or so on. So there might be limitations for it. So then, you know, for first iteration, we decided to go for a neck prototype. 
because you know, kind of the neck is also a part of some of the frisson responses. So you get uh, either chills uh, down the spine or up the neck, or also your uh, hair might stand up. So we thought it's a good start. And we used first pelty elements or thermal modules and also vibrotactile feedback. In later iterations, we moved just to a thermal feedback, uh, two activators on the back of the neck, uh, around on the upper side of the tra trapezius muscle. And they would activate with slight cold feedback. So for an initial test, it seemed to work. So this is just with 10 participants, around 30 minutes per participant. We had two music pieces uh, that uh, are based on related work. So Chopin and Gustav Holst. Uh, we counterbalance the conditions, so music pieces with neck bend, with, with, uh, without neck bend, with neck bend, uh, with uh, activation and without activation. And from an initial test, we can say that it seems that slight uh, cold feedback really provides uh, more instances of reported frisson. So there's a slight positive feedback, but, you know, still quite little participants and we'll have to continue and see um, also with a little bit of redesign. So we want to change the order and placement of the Peltier elements for the continuation work as well. Uh, now moving to the last part. So we talked about detection, induction, and now let's talk about sharing or transmitting frisson. Uh, here the idea would be, you know, you are listening to a uh, musical piece, a classical uh, piece, and one person gets a frisson that is detected over the wristband, and then it's distributed, it ripples through the neighbors, uh, they, they get activated over uh, the neckband, and hopefully also free, feel frisson again uh, around the same time, uh, just after the red circled uh, person uh, felt the aesthetic chills. So in this case, then, you know, we would have all of the audience members need to wear sensors and actuators. Uh, we would need uh, friction detection and also then uh, the activation uh, based on that. Uh, for that, we also um, organized another concert. In this case, 50 audience members. The program was around one and a half hours. And the setup was, as you see here, so performers on uh, the top. And then we had uh, two sections, uh, one, so uh, 25 users would wear just the wristband as a kind of control group. And the second group, uh, 25 users would wear wristband and neckband. So it would get actually the detection and also the activation. Uh, so, you know, 50 plus wristbands needed charging and uh, 25 neckbands uh, were manufactured. And this is a picture from the actual concert uh, with the uh, neckband, neckband section. And here is how this should work. So, you know, you have uh, first one person, you detect the frisson, uh, and then you um, ripple it out to the neighbors. Then the next person might feel we saw we detect that over the wristband and then ripple it out to the other people that haven't uh, gotten activation yet and uh, so on. So you have then a wave of frisson hopefully moving through the audience members. This is another setup, Yan He, uh, who also did a lot of the organization parts or so on at the piano. And uh, here is then a small video that uh, summarizes uh, the work. And at the end, you see also the servers, the recording server, the uh, activation server, and uh, the, I uh, know, the detection server, and also the activation server.
question you might have now, did it work? Hmm. Not, not completely sure. Again, here, work in progress, so the analysis is ongoing. And we can't also really say because, yeah, we had this control group and we could see more friction events in the sharing group. But how to interpret that, that's really, really difficult. Uh, we are also working on design of uh, the wristbands as well as the neckband. And especially for the neckband, we got a couple of users, I think five or six or seven, that really didn't like uh, the neckband, not the activation, so the slight cold activation was okay, but just because it was a little bit too tight and a little bit too uncomfortable. So we're working on a redesign. We have the next concert in April, recorded all of the data and we'll make it also publicly available uh, soon. You know, look also a little bit more what we can find out about what happened. Uh, this brings me to the end of the presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. The, I just wanted to thank a couple of people. First and foremost, Jan He, who organized this, who also introduced us uh, to uh, of, uh, Frisson, uh, and also the, the team. So this was for the second concert, the extended team. Uh, thanks a lot for everybody who was involved. Uh, here are then also all of the names. So these are the people that did the actual work, that not just doing the presenting like I do right now. I hope I haven't missed anybody. Uh, so also thanks to George, uh, Ding Ding, uh, Danny, and so on, and all of the other people involved. Uh, uh, GY Planning, the Studio Apollon, uh, also uh, the uh, pian pianists and uh, interactive uh, performers. Uh, so thanks a lot. Um, yeah, that brings me to the end of the presentation. Um, as I said, we have a third concert probably in April uh, next year in Yokohama, Tokyo area. So if you're interested, uh, let me know. Also, if you have a general interest in affect or similar phenomenon, uh, also um, just uh, write me an email. It would be good if you mention Frisson or also the uh, remote uh, experience in the subject, so I can just filter that out. And uh, something completely different, we also have a conference uh, next year, March, submission deadline is January 7th, Augmented Humans in uh, Japan and Germany and cyberspace that deals with maybe similar um, work. So thanks a lot for uh, listening and uh, I hope um, yeah, I told you something interested in the last 20 minutes. Bye. Hello and welcome back to the FAM channel. Thank you, Kai, for the very interesting talk. And Kai should actually be with us to answer a few questions. Hello, Kai. Yeah, hello. Yeah. And we actually do have a few questions already. And the first one sounds a bit more like a comment, uh, but I tell you anyway. So one one viewer noted that there is a uh, technical cybernetics and systems course here at the TU Ilmenau, and wanted to know if you were aware of this already. Uh, actually, actually, I wasn't, but that sounds that sounds quite fun. Uh, I'm getting more and more interested in cybernetics as well, and I think it's useful to revisit some of the ideas uh, around feedback loops, as I said at the beginning. So that's cool if if you if you're already looking into that, and I think especially. Uh, if people go into HCI fields, I think it's quite useful to get a little bit of that background. Yes, nice. Okay, let's go to the next question. Uh, it's about neural networks. Which type of the neural network was used? Have you considered neural net different neural differential equations such as echo state network as, or reservoir computing, which are good when modeling stiff time consciousness processes? <laughs> That's actually a really good question and actually also a good hint for what to do next. Uh, I just tried to look up, I saw the question already also in the chat. I tried to look up what we used and I think at the beginning we just used support vector machines, so not neural networks. And I know now we are using some neural network, but I don't know the configuration and I couldn't check. I'll get back to the um, person who asked the question. Uh, what was interesting for me was that the the data looks already quite good. The sensor data looks actually quite good, and I would assume that uh, in most cases uh, any classifier will will do a decent job for the lab experiments. For the other works, I think 
yeah, that sounds quite interesting. I also want to go more towards, um, um, yeah, nonlinear dynamics uh, work as well in terms of of uh, of estimating uh, frisson or different feelings. But that's that's a really good hint. But that would be more question also for Cha Wen uh, Han, uh, co-author of the the paper that is also linked. Uh, she is uh, our data analyst and so on and knows what what she used. So the first classifier was a support vector machine, fairly basic. And I think recently we use a neural network, but I thought it's just very straightforward PyTorch, um, long training, but nothing, nothing special, nothing fancy so far. Okay, nice. I guess, I guess she will probably also hear from the questions then. And then yep. let's go to the next question. Um, have you considered or tested the effects of adversarial stimulus, such as attempting to cause frisch, frisson waves in, in boring situations instead of like interesting ones? Um, that's also quite a good or interesting question. I mean, there were some, some audience members also that um, uh, mentioned that the neck band was actually a little bit uncomfortable, so I'm not really sure if we caused a frisson with them. And uh, I don't know what would happen if you. I think you probably would just make the um, the situation uncomfortable, anyways. I'm not sure what would happen then uh, if you're stimulating uh, cold feedback. Actually, you, you might get a fear response in these cases if you. In, in a boring situation, I'm not sure if you, if you, hmm, yeah, I, I actually, I don't know. It's definitely an interesting idea uh, to to use it in boring situations. Can you get somebody to change their their feeling and get to a more excited state? Uh, we are playing often. We played a little bit with uh, thermal feedback. And it was always interesting if you change the thermal feedback. So instead of if you see something hot in VR, you give cold stimulus or so on. It really is a little bit confusing and interesting. I haven't thought about that in the frisson situation and if it works for boring work. But that's definitely cool or interesting. So if somebody wants to play with that, I would be uh, up for also giving a little bit of help or uh, ideas in that direction. Okay, thank you for for answering these questions. Unfortunately, there don't seem to be any more of them. So that's it. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. That's a topic I haven't really thinking that much about, but thank you very much. It was very interesting. Okay. Thanks a lot also for having me, and it's always fun, and I always uh, enjoy the feedback. Uh, yeah, there's also, again, the live demonstration behind me, so you oh. saw my excitement level kind of increasing or decreasing with the questions. Oh, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> okay, yeah, thanks okay. a lot. Then Bye. see you, and here on the FAM channel, the next uh, thing happening will at 11 p.m. the lightning talk, or not on the FAM channel, but one of the next things happening at RC3 will be at 11 p.m. the lightning talks at remote Rhein Ruhr stage. And here on, on our channel actually at 12 a.m. or midnight, there will be the next Herald News Show. And until then, until then bye. <laughs>